Jeffrey Neal Sheets, Deputy Jeffrey, Jeffrey Neal Sheets, 30, died 20 years ago this week. He was my brother-in-law. I don't know if the first shot hit him in the head or if it was the second shot, but one of them did. The other one hit him in the forearm. The bullet came from a 22 caliber Derringer, easily concealable, a small gun. And he was shot in a place where he didn't have to be in the first place. But he did have to be there because that's the kind of guy he was. It was around noon on May 19th, 1994, two days after my sister's birthday, his wife. They talked about death that week. They'd been to the driver's license bureau because he had to get his license renewed. And they had this discussion about, what do you think about donating your organs? Nah, I'm not gonna do that. I feel weird about it, I feel weird about it, okay. So he didn't, didn't sign the card. Uh, so it's around 11.30, he should be going off to lunch. He hears this call come from the fire department that there's been an explosion near Wausau, Wisconsin, a little town called Ringle, which is about 12 miles east. It's a rural area, not very wealthy, farmers, and uh, he's about a mile away. He's the first responder. Fire department's gonna take 10 minutes to get there. So he pulls into this driveway, and it's, the, it's a driveway of a trailer and a farm. And he gets out of his car and he walks up and he sees that there's a building that's been knocked off its foundation. There's been an explosion. And next to that building, he sees a man who's trying to move geese away from that building. And he tells the man to move away and the man yells some explicative at him and says, if you're not here to help, get the hell out of here. And so he goes back to his car and he says, this guy's hostile. I want to have, uh, can we get some backup here? Well, about a month before, there had been an explosion in a nearby town. And a person got killed. And it wasn't the first explosion that got him, it was the second. Sometimes in a, in a building, natural gas will build up after a first explosion and someone, something will set it off a second time. Dispatcher said, no, Jeff. You got to get that guy away from the building. And so, he started to walk up to the guy, and uh, it, was, it was a really warm day, kind of like what we had on Monday. It, it kind of reminded me of that day. It was, it was just uh, kind of humid, those first days of spring when you kind of go, ugh, we're getting for this now. Get the air conditioners out, turn the air conditioning on. And he's walking through this field and it was freshly plowed, at least that's what the prosecutor told us at the trial. And the guy pulled the gun and dropped him. I don't know if it's the first shot or the second shot, but he dropped him into this freshly plowed field. I knew the guy who uh, was running the ambulance crew, because uh, I went to high school up there. And uh, he'd testify later that he could tell that Jeff was pretty much dead. Um, and I didn't realize that I, that day I was at work. I work at the Rockford Register Star. I was a reporter then, and uh, uh, I was out doing something on the east side and really bored, and I came back to the office, and uh, George Ed Braun, the columnist, said, sit down, I gotta tell you something. I'm going, tell me. I said, she said, sit down. So I sit down, and she tells me, and I'm like, oh, geez. She said, your brother-in-law's been shot. <clears throat> and I don't remember what I did, but I found myself in the car pulling out of the parking lot, and I started singing for some reason. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. And I think I sang all the verses and I was crying. Um, it was kind of a blur going up to Wisconsin to the, uh, to, to the hospital. Uh, we stopped about halfway and I remember it was, it was beautiful spring day and the lupin were blooming, these beautiful blue bonnets, these flowers in the sand country up in central Wisconsin. Um, and we got to the hospital and it was a terrible scene. My sister is a very fragile person to begin with. Um, I never thought she'd get married. And uh, she met Jeff, ironically, when he was 16 and she was 22. He was a bagger at a grocery store and she was a teacher in this town. And 
Um, she'd go in to buy her produce and whatever else she was buying, and he kind of took a liking to her, and you know, thought it was kind of weird, there was a big age difference, but uh, um, it worked out for him, and it was true love. She was mad about this guy, and he was mad about her. So he had two kids. Uh, Aaron was six, and Logan was two. Uh, and so we'd went right to the hospital, and, and he was in the ICU, and uh, it was pretty clear it was dire. Um, and so I'm a news guy. I'm used to telling stories uh, about other people, and here I am in the middle of this story and the TV stations are outside, and I find myself suddenly as the PR guy for my family in a situation that nobody, nobody ever dreams they're gonna be in. Um, it was a, it, what I remember about that time was, was uh, it was just very difficult on everybody. I remember compassion and kindness from people who would bring us food. I remember these peanut bars that sustained me. They were peanuts with, with uh, angel food cake and frosting. Uh, my mom calls them mocha bars, but there's no chocolate in them, and they're just delicious. And I remember that's kind of what sustained me for three or four days. One of the happiest guys in the hospital was the Catholic chaplain. And I think he knew what was going on, and he knew that Jeff was, uh, was going to die. And so he started talking about organ donation. Um, and he showed up a couple times until we said no, and then he disappeared. We didn't see him again. And uh, two days after Jeff had been shot, the guy had been in custody for two days. Um, I, told the I told the TV cameras that we were you know, very sad and we're, you know, we're praying for Jeff that he, that he makes through. And uh, um, they asked me comments about the shooter, and I'm, yeah, you know, it's like, well, I hope they got the guy, and I hope that he's convicted, if, if, if that's the case. <clears throat> but what's really going on is we had to decide on whether or not we are going to pull the plug. My sister didn't want to. She didn't want to let go. There was no brain activity for two days. Um, and so it was my job to convince her to let go. And, I, and she did. Uh, we pulled the plug, and Jeff died. And in a sense, when she pulled that plug, it kind of pulled the plug on began this, this slow deterioration over 20 years of my relationships with my family. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been very difficult to, the things that she went through, the, the big depression and, and the problems that her children had, the problem that she had raising these children as a single mom and being um, um, overwhelmed. And it, we, we went up about every three weeks for the first two years it's about a 180 mile drive. Um, and then we went up about every four weeks. And then we went up, not very, not very often at all. We went up for the, the, uh, the trial and he was convicted. Um, we've been through a lot since then. Diane almost died of liver failure. She had a very rare disease and I was the power of attorney. Um, I don't know that she realized that I was making the medical decisions for her at the time. Uh, she pulled through. She, got a, she ended up getting a liver transplant, which is an amazing thing. Uh, she's fallen in love again. And, um, and her children, it's been really interesting. As, as she has fallen in love, her children have healed as well. Um, her daughter is married and has a child, who's a great mother, and a, just a great mother. Um, is doing very, very well. So through this whole thing, their, their healing has taken 20 years, and I hope that, you know, as, as I move forward, I hope that my relationships heal with them, um, because I'm not ready to, I've, I've said goodbye to Jeff, but I'm not really ready to say goodbye to them, so, thank you.